Okay, so the Lord started speaking to me, he said, get up. So, I'm here. I want to read something to you. I was expecting something different. There is a second one I may make. This says at the end of Revelation 6, that the wrath, the day of the wrath of God has come at that point in Revelation. Now, we have 22 chapters in Revelation. And the day, the great, the day of great day of the wrath of the Lamb comes at the end of verse of chapter six. Chapter six. That's sixteen chapters. And, and the wrath of God ends around chapter nineteen. So we're talking about 13 chapters. That's more than half the book of Revelation is about the great day of the wrath of the Lamb. So let's read this here. It says, I looked, this is verse 12. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. And everyone wants to focus on those amazing signs and go look for them outside. Especially all the false prophets want to do that and try to deceive you about those things. But go further. Verse 13, And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. In the late season of the figs growing, when a mighty wind hits those fig trees, all the figs drop. Not a few, all of them drop. We're not talking about the Leonids or something like that. You know, the meteor shower that, that happens with lots of meteors. We're talking about the, the stars in the sky falling, all of them. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind, then the sky itself receded as a scroll when it is rolled up and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Every island and mountain was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth and great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. But the mountains are being moved out of their place. So if they're hiding in the caves of the mountains, those men are being moved out as well. And those men who hid in the caves of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lambkin. The word is lambkin. Lamb. And I'll just verify that to make sure. This is verse uh, chapter 6. The second to the last verse in the chapter. Uh, give me just a minute to find it here. Yeah, Lambkin. So, <clears throat> for the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? It says, and from the wrath of the Lambkin. That means the great day of his wrath is the great day of the wrath of the Lambkin. And it has come. They are begging the earth to kill them. These men were begging to be killed even by the earth itself. That's how desperate they were. So as to not face the great wrath of the Lambkin. And what's interesting is that it ends, chapter 6 ends with them saying, For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Meaning they have no idea who could stand the day of the wrath of the Lambkin. 
no one is powerful enough to. And it goes right in then to the next part in chapter 7. They at least correctly, well, this could be one way you could divide it. There's another way you could divide it too. With the beginning of the, the great seal. Because it is part of the same thing that just follows. So actually they've divided it wrongly again. Almost every place that I read, they've divided the chapters wrongly. This chapter should have started when he saw, he says, I looked when, I, when he opened the sixth seal. That's where it should have uh, been broken because what they say here joins immediately with the answer to that. Who is able to stand? Then it says, after these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending, and he goes into talking about marking the servants of God from the 12 tribes of Israel in the midst of the face with the signet ring, the seal of God, the stamp. So that's the answer. He answers that, but that's not all of who will stand because then it goes into the great multitude, the throng. It's innumerable. No one can count who are wearing white robes before the throne with palms. So, and he says, and he cried out to the four angels. And it says, then I saw another angel ascending from out of the east. And this is interesting because literally what it says there is, and I saw another angel uh, stepping up from off of the uh, rising of light of the sun, uh, holding uh, the signet of the living God. And that's, that's the most interesting part right there. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. And the word harm is a little different here too. Uh, to, oh, to do injustice. It's not harm like just physically harm. It's to do injustice to it. They were given, uh, it was given to them to do injustice to the earth, the sea, or the trees. He says, do not, do not do injustice to the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed, like with a stamp, a signet ring, the servants, these are slaves, of our God in the midst of their faces. And I heard the number of those who were sealed. So now this is interesting because it says, don't do that until we've done this. And then the very next verse, it says, and, and he says, and I heard the number of those who, and, and the verb there is, have been sealed. Have been sealed. So it's done already by the next verse. Between three and four, some time passes because it's already done. All of them are sealed. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. That's it. 144,000, that's all. And then it lists the tribes. Now, interestingly enough, I've made this list of the tribes. These are the 12 tribes of Israel, okay? Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. Those are the original 12 tribes of Israel. But Joseph, Joseph's tribe was divided between his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And so they, they split their half of their inheritance of the land. But what's interesting is the 12 tribes that are listed here are different than the 12 tribes that were originally the sons of Israel. 
almost all of them are the same. But you have, you don't have Manasseh and Ephraim there. You have Joseph of the tribe of Joseph and Manasseh. But Manasseh is of the tribe of Joseph because he's the son of Joseph. So Joseph has one and a half shares in those being sealed of God, or shall we say a double share, actually, because it's still 12,000 from each. And uh, Ephraim is not there. And one of the 12 sons of Israel is not there. And there's a lot of speculation about that going all the way back to, um, I can't remember his name, <laughs> one of the early church fathers. And uh, Dan is the one, and they speculate that that's where the Antichrist is going to rise out from is the tribe of Dan. We have no indication about that, none whatsoever. But we do know about Ephraim. Ephraim is the one who, who was the one who completely corrupted the northern kingdom. That tribe was the one who had completely corrupted themselves and corrupted all of those around them. So it could be that they were so corrupted, so thoroughly corrupted, that there weren't 12,000 from among them. And that's very likely. Anyway, that's the interesting thing about that. <clears throat> but let's go a little further. After this list, it says, After these things, I looked and beheld, behold, a great multitude, this is the throng, which no one could number, no one could count, of all ethnicities, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the lambkin, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. I remember white robes, it says specifically here in Revelation, the white robes stand for the righteous deeds of the saints, of the terrifyingly clean ones. When you become terrifyingly clean, your actions then attribute to your white linen that you're wearing. And so here it says there's a great multitude that cannot be counted who are wearing white robes. And then it says, and crying out with a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lambkin. All the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever, amen. The word amen literally means firmly. 13, then one of the elders answered, saying to me, who are these arrayed in white robes? And where did they come from? And I, now remember this chapter 7. So the two beasts don't rise till chapter 13. And I said to him, sir, you know. So he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Okay, I want to look at this word come out of, verse 14, so we can get specific about it. Verse 14, it says, And I said to him, Sir, you know, he said to me, uh, yeah. He said to me, These are being those coming out, coming out of this present participle. These are those coming out of, these are the ones coming out of, not who come out of, but coming out of. These are the ones coming out of the Great Tribulation. and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. 
Now you say, well, that means that it was Jesus' righteousness. No, it wasn't. No. Because it clearly says the righteous, the, the white linen are the righteous deeds of the saints, not of Jesus. It means that Jesus' blood, the purpose of Jesus' blood, is for us to wash our robes so they become white, meaning we cleanse our actions so that our actions become the white linen. Our actions are cleansed by the blood of Jesus. To cleanse by the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus, it doesn't impute his righteousness upon us. It empowers us to do what is right so that we are righteous just as he is righteous. 1 John 3, 7. Dear children, do not be deceived, because men are going to want to deceive you on this point exactly. Dear children, do not be deceived. He who does what is right is righteous just as he is righteous. You want to be righteous as Jesus is righteous? You've got to do what is right to be just as right, righteous just as he is righteous. You have to. And the only way that's going to happen is by the blood of the lambkin. It's the only way. It's the only way. That's why this is important. These are the ones who come out of the great, who are coming. These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. And let's look at washing. And, and they wash. And they wash. These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation, tribulation, and they wash their robes, and hold on, and they wash the robes of them and whiten them. in the blood of the lambkin. And they washed their robes and whitened them. There's no time frame for those two. They're in the aorist. Talked about aorist tense. There's no time frame. It's a timeless tense. And so we don't know. The timing needs to be determined by context. And it says these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. And they wash their robes and make them white in the blood and whiten them in the blood of the lamb. <clears throat> so it doesn't say if it's as they're coming out of the great tribulation or while they're in the tribulation or after the tribulation and it doesn't matter. The fact is that they have that they do that that, that they do that at some point or any point or all points. Therefore, because they had done that, therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. The one who sits on the throne only dwells among those who come out of the great tribulation or coming out and wash their robes and whiten them in the blood of the Lamb. Only those who are changing their actions by the blood of the Lamb, only among those will God who sits on the throne dwell among us. This is why we continually plead with you and beg you to stop sinning. And we get no end of people arguing with us. You know, not all. Some of them are incredulous. They're saying, well, I don't believe it. it. Can it be true? Not like they don't believe it, like they're skeptical completely, but they just, they've never heard this. They've never heard anyone preaching this 
so solidly from Scripture, more solidly than the apostate church teaches their false teachings. They have to do all kinds of contortions in order to make their doctrine believable. Or they have to blind you to most of Scripture and have you just look at one or two little verses taken out of context, like Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. It's not just verse 10 that they take it out of context from. It's verses 1 through 7, which rebuke them for their use of those two verses. So verses uh, Ephesians 2, 1 through 7 upholds this. Because you've stopped walking in the lust of the flesh and obeying Satan. That's Ephesians 2, 1 through 7. That's what this is saying too. You no longer worship Satan or the image or the beast. I'm not saying that, that the tribulation is something like that, but I'm just saying it as a metaphor at this point. What I'm saying is that this is talking about the actual great tribulation and them coming out and, and washing the clothes and whitening them in the blood of the Lamb. That's what we're supposed to be doing too. And he says, and he who sits on the throne will dwell among them, not among anyone who claims to be a Christian or claims that he likes Jesus. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them who resist the beast, the, the little hunted game animal, who resist the fabulous serpent, who resist all of that, he will dwell among them who wash their clothes and whiten them in the blood of the Lamb, not among anyone else. No one else. Those who claim that God dwells among them are liars who do not do this. Then it says a promise for, for us who do that. They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them, nor any heat. For the lambkin, who is in the midst of the throne, will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Only us who wash our clothes and whiten them in the blood of the Lamb, and resist that fabulous serpent and all that he's doing. If you're not resisting and standing fast in the persuasion of the Lord of glory, these promises do not apply to you. If you can stand there in honesty and say, no, I still sin, these don't apply to you. You're not among those. You must be washing your clothes and whitening them in the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb, the power of the blood. Would you be free? There's power in the blood. You know this old hymn? Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. So, free from the burden of sin. That doesn't mean that God allows you to continue sinning and he just relieves your conscience of it. That's what happens to people who sear their consciences. That's not what God does. God livens your conscience with the law. Paul says it. He says, I didn't know what sin was until I heard the law. God livens your conscience to the law, uh, to sin through the law. 
The law has a purpose. It's not useless and inert. It has a purpose. And every command from God has that same purpose. And we are to obey God's commands. Do what's right. Stop sinning, both. Just stopping sin is not everything about doing what's right. There's more to it than that. Let's finish this up. It says, for the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them. He's not shepherding you. If you are not relying on the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, the lambkin of God, that lambkin was not a substitution for us in the penalty of sin. That lambkin was the Passover lamb. But it was much, much more than that. Because those sacrifices of animals were temporary. Whereas the blood of Jesus has the power to free us from sin. And if you haven't been freed from sin, you don't know the lambkin. He's not shepherding you. As much as you desire to be free from sin, which is great, you're being called out of the world. But that's not all that there is to salvation. That's being rescued from Egypt into the wilderness. And your heart is tested in the wilderness regarding sin and obedience. And remember that Jesus was with them in the wilderness. I've gone over this recently. Not only was he the rock from which they got water, and it says that he followed them around. And so that sounds like this where it says that, um, and, and lead them, that the lamb who's in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water. Except in the desert, he was the rock from which the living fountains of water came. And so Jesus was with them. Not only that, they heard the same gospel that we hear. That's what it says in Hebrews 4. Not only that, he was the bronze serpent. Not only that, it was Jesus, it says, who didn't allow them to enter into his rest. It wasn't about God the Father, it was about Jesus. The blood of Jesus has great power. And if you do not depend on it to overcome sin, you're not one of these. You're not the ones among whom the one who sits on the throne dwells. You're not the ones who are shepherded by the lamb who sits in the midst of the throne. You're not the ones who are led to living fountains of waters by the lambkin. And you're not the ones God will wipe every tear from your eyes. Stop sinning. You're not among us. You want to be among us. You've got to stop sinning. You have to. Because the alternative is disobedience and you will die in this wasteland. May the Lord bless you as you seek Him with all your heart.